pollution is one of the biggest threats to biodiversity and the environment as it can come in a number of forms ranging from simple fertilizer and agricultural runoff to plastic and other trash pollution. Like the rest of the world, Zimbabwe is not spared as its water bodies and rivers are heavily polluted with mercury from alluvial gold processing or raw sewage, fertilizers and chemicals. A visit to Lake Chivero, the main water source for the capital city, Harare, Upper Umguze Dam just outside Ulawayo and other water sources around the country showed that most of these fresh water bodies have been seriously affected. These water sources are heavily choked by the invasive water weed, a free-floating perennial aquatic plant that forms huge thick mats on the water surface. The extent at which water hyacinths is clogging these water sources is a cause for concern as the weed is slowly blocking water intake points. Decomposition of the plant turns the water green and releases nutrients into the water leading to the blooming of algae which produces toxic substances. Water hyacinths weed tracks its origins from Latin America. The plant uh, that has got its origins from South America mm. is called the uh, Agricia um, graspis. That is its, its biological name. It, it spreads so fast. It is a serious problem. Um, and also because it spreads quite easily. It spreads by birds. Um, and unfortunately also um, people who like to have beautiful plants in, um, in the uh, aquarium and so forth. So that's how water has got into here. People brought it because it, when it flowers it looks beautiful. Same as the water, the, the uh, Cariba weed in, in Cariba, the uh, uh, Sarvenia. Yes, it looks very nice for um, in a, an aquarium, your fish pond, your fish tank and so forth. But when it is more than a feet, you just pull out the feet and throw it away. When it rains, it goes to the water system. The weed has spread to parts of the country, choking rivers, lakes and dams. But what is causing the rapid growth of this water weed? Harare is sitting on its catchment. As such, effluent discharged and water that runs off the surface in the city finds its way into Lake Chivero, the main water body that supplies the capital with industrial, agricultural and domestic water. The story revolves around pollution from sewer waste and other types of waste that generate or do, that feeds uh, into our water bodies things like nitrates and, uh, and phosphates being the top um, culprits. So obviously those cities, perhaps they are located, but particularly talking about Harare, its location, like I said, is on, on a hilltop. So all drainage uh, drains from the city feeding into the, into the water board where we are getting our drinking water anyway. So obviously because of that location, also because of growth of, uh, of these cities, you see this problem of, uh, of, um, uh, of water hyacinth uh, now, now, now coming back to us. If you look at it, um, uh, the literature confirms that uh, water essence was uh, uh, identified uh, in Zimbabwe in around 1937, but there's been silence from then up to almost, almost in 2000. That's where you see the city was now growing, so a lot of pollution was now getting into, into water bodies. Like Lake Chivero, the proliferation of water hyacinths along Umguza River in Matebeland North is due to industrial and domestic effluent along Machehunshope and Mazai rivers. This is where uh, our effluent from uh, what you call this, our two streams, which are running through the city, which are Machehunshope and the uh, Machehunshope River and the uh, Mazai River, uh, join and eventually discharge into Umguza River. 
uh, as you can see, the color of the water uh, is showing what you call this uh, heavy pollution. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot capture the single smell, otherwise the, there is a very pungent smell which is coming out from this effluent here. Uh, these discharges are from the industries basically, uh, and also from uh, uh, domestic uh, sewer sources. Uh, the two streams I, I mentioned earlier, being Mazai and uh, Machetepe River, uh, they run through different industries. Uh, this wastewater at this point here, from our tests and analysis, we've noted is got very high concentration of nutrients and as well as heavy metals. These nutrients are the ones which are causing the proliferation of uh, hyacinth, the water hyacinth uh, in Umpuza River. Besides pollution of surface water, raw sewage disposal in these water sources and poor management of wetlands is also contributing towards contamination of both surface and underground water. We have a lot of uh, nutrients coming from uh, suburbs. I think talking about the position of Harare, a lot of uh, nitrates are coming from sewer waste, from sewer uh, pipe bursts and also urban agriculture. So obviously those nutrients, they find their way into water bodies where water hyacinth is becoming a problem. Yes, when it started, oh, it was brought to Zimbabwe, to Africa as an ornamental plant, but then it turned out to be, to be an invasive species because it did not find uh, a predator that could control its population. Wetlands act as sponges and ecological lungs that purify underground water and absorb pollutants to avoid water contamination. Where does the water in Lake Chivero come from? Well, people say it comes from Manyami River. Mm -hmm. Maybe now, if you go to Seke and you look at the Seke Dam wall, you might see some water are spilling over. But go there in July, August, and so forth, there's no spillage because the river has stopped flowing. And that is what is considered the main source of water in uh, Lake Chivero. However, if we add up the amount of sewage that is going into Lake Chivero, from Marimba, from uh, Mukuisi, um, from Nyatsime. Um, this, at some, in some, part, in some uh, periods of the year, is more than the flow of the Manyame River. So we actually need our sewage to go back. So it's in a warning these things happen and can happen. Now, um, even if you take the Manyame River, where does it get water from? Where does the water that flows in our rivers come from? From wetlands. In the dry season, you see the river is still flowing. There has been no rain. It's water that is being slowly released from um, 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 wetlands. So this uh, so-called densification, you know, um, you must build on this um, piece of land that are lying idle. They are not lying idle. Apart from pollution of surface water sources and mismanagement of green belts, these cities also deposit water pollutants such as sediments, nutrients, toxic chemicals from industrial activities and pathogens from waste in its water sources. Uh, as you can see the height of uh, this, uh, what do you call this, uh, single plant of water hyacinth. Uh, it's showing it's getting uh, what do you call this, adequate nutrition for it, for its growth. As if you can see, the dam itself is being covered completely by this water hyacinth, uh, which is due to pollution. Uh, this plant thrives mainly on uh, nutrients, which are phosphates and nitrates, uh, and continuous discharge of uh, such uh, chemicals into the water uh, actually allows for its continuous growth and uh, continuous spread. Uh, currently, Umkuza Dam Lower and upper Mkuda Dam has been covered completely uh, by this, uh, what you call alien invasive species. Uh, this plant has been was introduced to try to assist in cleaning or removal of pollution, but has now grown uh, beyond control 
uh, and it's currently its control and removal will be a very difficult task. These nutrients also provide food for water hyacinth that is choking Lake Chiviru, Umguza and other water sources in the country. The plant turns water green and dirty, making it expensive to purify and unsuitable for drinking and other domestic uses. A river has got a method where it's able to self-purify purify itself. But with the continued influx of this pollution, the river will not be able to do that. So you'll find this pollution here will even affect the sediments, the riverbeds. Eventually, uh, even what you call this, uh, the underground water can become contaminated eventually. So you'll find downstream, the water quality will remain poor. We continue using this kind of water for irrigation. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, we're looking at the situation where industry will grow. If that industry grows and we're not able to sustain uh, the amount of effort being produced, the levels of pollution in the water will increase. Which means we'll start finding higher levels of pollution inside the, our crops being used. Uh, and also, if for any reason we decide to take this water and use it for what you call this, we take it and try to uh, purify it for drinking purposes, it will become costly to try and purify this water. The weed also blocks water intake points, reducing water supplies to other water users. Upper Mguza Dam has been a source of water uh, for irrigation purposes downstream. Uh, a lot of farmers use the water for irrigating their crops. Uh, as well as uh, Umguza Dam was a source of uh, fish for fishmongers. But uh, due to the proliferation of this plant, this has uh, now affected the communities as there's no, uh, what do you call this, their fish catches have reduced drastically due to this, the presence of this plant. Thick mats formed by the plant have significant effects on biodiversity and its high transpiration rate can cause loss of water from the water bodies up to six times more compared to normal water surface evaporation. This weed uses a lot of water. As such, the lakes, rivers and the dams dry up quickly. As you can see, water is now a problem in a number of suburbs in Harare. That's what we are observing. If you look at uh, Chimero, there are communities that live around, around that lake. So obviously their livelihoods are then affected because their access to a lot of fish is now compromised because fish uh, is dying as a result of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this plant which is covering the surface, reducing oxygen, oxygen um, is entering into the water body and also being a haven of, uh, of predators like snakes which will end up now eating the fish and um, so obviously that has got a negative impact and also um, science confirms that existence of that particular weight um, it multiplies by three uh, the evaporation rate uh, so when you are comparing an open lake and a lake that is uh, covered with water hyacinth lake covered by water hyacinth is likely to lose a lot of water three times. So obviously we are going to see water levels falling in the lake as a result of that. So if communities around are using that water for irrigation purposes, obviously that is going to be an impact, to, to have a negative impact on their livelihoods because they will lose a lot. And also you see that uh, presence of water hyacinth uh, work as a, um, as a habitat again for snails that uh, uh, that are, are a vector to to to, to, to Biohazia and also the mosquitoes that uh, do help spread of uh, of malaria. So obviously, presence of that particular weed again has got a negative impact on environmental health and the health of the people who stays around it. The ability of water hyacinth to overrun and outcompete aquatic habitat is beyond belief. The species can rapidly dominate natural areas and can dramatically alter the species' composition, structure and function of plant communities. Even those who enter into this lake using boats can be trapped. Sometimes they end up calling for assistance. This dam uh, from archive data that we have shows that 
they within a period of four weeks where there was only what you call this isolated patches of this plant within four weeks this plant had covered the whole dam and it's continuing to grow it's continuously growing you can remove it today you come back tomorrow the place where you removed it is covered again Aquatic water hyacinth demands a lot of oxygen as such it leads to the reduction of oxygen levels in the water bodies and creates an uninhabitable environment for aquatic life, reducing species diversity and affecting ecological balance. By its nature, water hyacinth uh, presents a carpet-like material on top of water bodies and that will interfere with uh, growth of uh, other microorganisms that would need some light because it will work as a shed on top of water. And also, it will, uh, because, the, because it's quite, uh, it spreads faster, it grows faster, it takes a lot of nutrients, thereby outcompeting other, other phytoplankton plants. It also um, it takes a lot of oxygen, again, making other uh, plants uh, suffer so they cannot get access uh, to a lot of oxygen. So obviously, that, will, that plant will dominate. So we will see fish dying, we also see other organisms that uh, stays in water also being eradicated whenever uh, this type of food comes in. Besides the presence of fish inside this dam, there's all the, uh, there are plenty other what you call this aquatic plants and other aquatic animals which uh, rely uh, on what? On the oxygen and sunlight. Now, this plant having covered the dam, uh, there's no access or the amount of oxygen reaching what do you call this the water is uh, has been reduced as well as light penetration we've got other plants like uh, phytoplankton which fish feed on uh, now in the absence of sunlight uh, this phytoplankton uh, does not grow so it's starving what do you call this in a way we're starving the fish of what of uh, required nutrients uh, from these plants. Besides having harmful effects on aquatic life, water hyacinth also impacts negatively on health of lakeside communities as the weed provides a very good habitat for agents of malaria and bihazia. This fastest growing alien invasive species has an average yield of 100 to 140 tons of dry matter per hectare per annum and it clogs life of water bodies with its large intense mats. During the dry season, the weed becomes brown, surrendering life to excessive water shortage. In dry season, this weed becomes dry and turns brown. But when the rains come, it again turns green, and you wonder what is happening. You'd see that uh, it has got a cycle, usually in summers, uh, when temperatures are high, you see that uh, water is dominating, uh, dominating uh, on top of the water bodies. But during winter, it, it then collapses, so there will be dry matter, but then when we come to summer again, it will still boom up so obviously that's a cycle the wheat produces thousands of seeds and they remain viable for over 20 to 35 years outside water if the rains come this dry matter comes to life even if you take this dry weed and break it you can see that its stem is green to show that it's only that it is lacking in water. But if it gets water, it becomes live again. For years, Lake Chivero, Upper Umguza Dam and other choked water sources have supported a thriving fishing industry, creating income and employment to thousands of people. This weed is destroying livelihood for a number of people who depend on this lake. A lot of people survive on fish from this lake. People from Harare, Bulawayo, Gweru, or even Shurugi rely on fish from this lake. Thus, if the people fail to get fish, it will be hard for men. People they know about
People know Umguza for boat lodging and come here for boat cruising. But we recently realized that people are no longer coming. After seeing this water license, we inquired why our clients are no longer coming. That's where they told us that they want boat cruising and cannot come because of the water license, which is shocking the dam. However, with the rapid growth of water hyacinth in these water sources, fishing is becoming very expensive as the weed is slowly throttling fisheries, reducing species diversity and raising the cost of operations. When this weed comes, it captures fishing nets like a magnet. And when you are removing fish from the nets, you need to be extra careful to avoid destroying the fishing nets. We have lost a number of nets because of this weed. People buy fishing nets, but they are losing due to the weed. Thus, this weed is a big problem to us. We now do not know what to do with it. It also affects, I think, the movement of boards. It can just uh, clung to the to, to the engine of the of the boats, and it also affects um, affects um, e, I think access by the local people uh, to get water because it will also create a hedge around the water bodies so people cannot easily get access to to water. However, preliminary researches indicate that the weed removes toxic from the water bodies by absorbing heavy metals. We also have. Uh, tests which we also among the parameters we also check for phosphates and sulfates and the nitrates where these phosphates and nitrates uh, in areas where you're indicating the water will be now clearer and like they are less but you, what does that mean it means those nitrates have been absorbed by the water icing because it really fits on uh, that uh, those nutrients so uh, most of the nitrates and high, uh, sal phosphates are within the EMA limits, which means somehow the, the plant has absorbed them. You remember I also indicated that this was also used as a method to extract and clean the water, but the levels at which they have moved now is too high, and they are no longer within the limit that we can say we need the plant. The plant is no longer needed. It's also affecting us. According to a number of ecologists, the adverse effects of the weed far outweigh its benefits. It has got uh, an absorption capacity. It can remove uh, heavy metals like cadmium, heavy metals like mercury. That is coming from the industries, like I said before. So obviously, presence of that particular um, uh, weed is, is, is beneficial to some extent since it removes but however, the negatives, I think, when, when, when compared to the positives regarding the, its ecological impact, I think we don't need that weed. The water hyacinth weed can be removed chemically, mechanically, and biologically. However, these methods have failed to control the nuisance of the weed in many water sources. There is a lot of um, research material um, available. A lot of students have researched, a lot of scholars have researched about this water essence and they have given some recommendations like issue of uh, use of mechanical methods, just use some mechanical equipment, people just uh, get to the water and try to pull all the material from the water. That's one way, but that uh, plant will quickly come back. So obviously there's a cost implication. There's also some inroads in terms of uh, the use of uh, um, the herbicides like glyphosate, uh, which is quite effective, uh, within five days after spraying with, uh, with a knapsack, you will see uh, the plant dying. But after some time, it will come back again because those chemicals uh, cannot destroy the uh, seed bank of uh, that particular weed. So at times, the efforts will just uh, go in vain. Uh, and also, you will see that uh, because we are talking about uh, presence of phosphates and nitrates that are coming from effluent water, Obviously, as long as we have lecture as a polluted water, we'll keep on having this menace around us. So I think we we'll need um, uh, to, to, to see the local authority making sure that it is discharging treated uh, water to, 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 to water bodies like lecture. Globally, a number of environmental protocols and principles have been formulated 
adopted and signed to criminalize pollution. But as responsible citizens, do Zimbabweans really need laws, principles or protocols to protect and create a secure and sustainable environment for both present and future generations?